And good evening. I am called to order the March 18th, 7 p.m. regular meeting of the Town Council. Will you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God,
very large volumes of, and, and paper co paper copies. Um, so certainly bringing that information into you know current technology and having it accessible would would be useful. Um, also, they do talk um, about having um, a self-guided tour. Um, that's something that we um, could be working with um, with Kate's new, new position for, for communications and, and those sorts of things. Um, we think it would be great to have um, some type of you know, Android, Apple app or something to do a self-guided tour to our historic sites here, here in the community. Um, they also have um, site review. One of their recommendations is, is that we form a regular standing historic preservation implementation committee um, and that one of their annual tasks, and that will be a later item this evening as well, um, would to be annually review the list so that we make sure that these buildings are, one, um, still standing, and two, if there should be any additions. And through that addition process, they talked about um, having kind of a self-nomination process where if somebody is interested on being to the on our list, which will be in the ordinance later to come, um, this evening actually, um, to have a mechanism for, for those folks to apply and, 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 and ask to be on the list and have a re them review that as a standing committee. Um, let's see what else. And uh, again, just some work, you know, work specific working group tasks, um, signage program. Um, some of that would be plaques that, that designate, you know, offering plaques to, to the homeowners that have homes that are designated as significant, as well as some local signage, which would be more of neighborhood type type meetings that that should, again, you know, each neighborhood is unique. Um, Scarborough was made initially of six villages. Um, they think it's important to kind of touch home with each of those villages and, and host a few neighborhood meetings and, and talk about, you know, important um, areas that maybe they, that would be of use to be designated out. Obviously, Pine Point is a big area they already, that is well established, has its own signage that says, welcome to Pine Point. Um, but there are other areas like that within the community that, that would benefit from some, si from some signage. Um, Again, there, there's also some um, historic sites that would benefit from some, some signage. Um, so again, very task-specific working groups um, to work on things like that. Um, so as, as I said, it's the quick kind of run-through of, of the report that we all have in front of us. <laughs> Is there any questions that you might have? Uh, Look up and down. Are we going to get into the discussion of how homes and properties are put onto the list in the discussion of the ordinance? Into the criteria? Yeah, that the criteria should be listed in um, in the ordinance, yes. So we'll discuss that at that point in time? Yep. Okay. So right now it's just the, the report. Um, any other questions? No, I mean, it just looked like an impressive amount of work by the committee. The detailed analysis and the very substantive recommendations, I thought, were it was very impressive. And if I might throw, um, for maybe just a moment, um, if I could throw Craig Frederick under the bus to see if um, he was the, the mastermind chair behind behind this committee. So if he had any, any other comments he might like to add to the, uh, on the report. Um, yeah, he sees it. I'm sorry. Can, can I can I can I force you to go to the podium? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm Craig Frederick, and I am or was the chair. Of, I guess I still am the chair of the <laughs> ad hoc committee, uh, although this was a committee uh, job. Uh, one of the things that we focused on is the need, historic preservation is ongoing, and we thought that a mechanism was necessary to keep the review going. Uh, we talked about in the committee what to do about things that we thought might be historic in 50 years. Didn't come up with a real easy answer to that, and the answer is, is to 
keep plugging away at it. And in the report, one of our major recommendations is that the uh, that a successor committee, at least once a year, review the list, mostly for additions, but also possibly for deletions, uh, and that that be done on an ongoing basis, and then a recommendation be made to the council every year, since it's, of course, your decision uh, who to actually put on the list What in the final analysis is there. Other than that, it was mostly detailed things that we think should be uh, followed up on, uh, not all at once, not all in the next year, but that we just keep an eye on the, the history. We were, we were worried because of the 1994 survey. We just stumbled over that getting going, did not know it existed, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me pretty obvious that it was an example that if you don't keep punching away at the historic preservation and keeping it in mind, you will lose things like that. Getting that data and the treasure trove that the Scarborough Historical Society maintains uh, is, I think, very important to just, even if we don't do anything, let's at least keep the data so somebody in the future can keep, keep it going. And the town already has the mechanism in place for that in its GIS system. It should be possible to integrate the historical data there. There is a, a historical layer already in the GIS system. Uh, so it's it's already started. We just think you ought to plug away on it. Not that it's a uh, huge, most important thing ever done, but we live in a very old town and we ought to uh, we ought to remember that. Thank you very much. Is that enough, Madam Chair? That is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, I just would like to maybe wrap up if there's no other comments. That um, I do just want to say thank you to, to the committee. They worked, you know, diligently and and, and very productively um, towards coming to the goal of having this report. Um, I do believe they have maybe one more meeting before before they sunset, but um, but they have done an outstanding job. I, I think of really taking you know a thorough look and, and spending a significant amount of time on how to encourage preservation without demanding or forcing or requiring preservation and to really have that partnership of working with the homeowner. Um, so again, just thank you very much for, for all of your time. So. With that, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item, which is order number 15-007 which is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, establishing a new section, VIIG, Historic Preservation Provisions, which would create a local list of historic properties and provide for zoning and building code incentives for preservation of these historic resources. So again, this is the public hearing. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this matter? Madam Chair, would it be helpful? Uh, Dan Bacon's here. He doesn't need to make a presentation, but certainly can can do that if that serves yep, your we'll needs or the public's. Uh, the, I think he's done it once before, so you could maybe do the highlights at this point. Would that be okay? Sure. <laughs> now you're in the hot seat. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Madam Chair and, and Town Councilors. Uh, I think you did a great introduction already with your presentation of uh, the work of the ad hoc Preservation, Historic Preservation Committee. I think this is one of their key accomplishments is, is forwarding this proposal to you and um, illustrates a lot of their, their hard work. Um, as has already been mentioned, um, this, this committee came up with a local, locally significant historic properties list, um, widowing down a very long list from the inventory that Craig was mentioning in 94 to 48 to 50 properties um, that are proposed. And, and in the ordinance, there is um, a criteria that, w that was used for selection to this list. Um, and I, think, I know that they were very diligent and, and thoughtful in terms of what was on the list. So these zoning amendments established the local list um, of, of locally significant historic properties. And then, um, as 
the chair has indicated, really try to encourage and incentivize preservation through zoning and building codes, but not require it. So they're, they're kind of the, there's the two key encouragements or incentives. Uh, one is to provide for a residential density credit, what we're calling a residential density credit. And basically the way that's written is that, say there's a historic property uh, within a subdivision or a development site, <coughs> Um, the developer of the property would um, get credit for preservation of that building and lot and, and be able to get, instead of that lot using up um, the density that, that the lot allows for, they actually get to apply that amount of density to the rest of the project. So um, they don't, they get basically, you get to count what could happen on that property twice within a development project. So that's one incentive designed to discourage removing an old building in favor of a new building um, because you can get just as many um, development lots by preserving it. The other is in our building and fire codes, there are actually exceptions for historic buildings that are recognized at the state, federal, local level. And since there's a new list proposed, um, these properties, if enacted, would be able to take advantage of those exceptions and and that can help with um, rehabs and renovations of these buildings that they can, in many cases, preserve some of the historical character or, or, or things that make them historic and not have to bring them up to code. So that's seen as a, a pretty nice incentive. Um, the other thing that uh, this allows for or actually requires is if a project goes before the planning board, there does need to be some look at the, the property and consideration uh, made for historic preservation before decisions made to remove the building. Um, it's a step. It's not a mandate that the building needs to stay, but it's a it's a check in to see if historic preservation is possible through these incentives. So, in a nutshell, that's um, the amendments proposed before you. Thank you, Dan. And before we get too far, we do have the public hearing. So, does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none. My little gavel. Pleasure of the gun. <coughs> Move approval. Second. All right. And discussion. So question for you is um, the relationship between the ordinance, um, including its changes, and this historical preservation implementation committee or a future committee. Um, I don't see any correlation between the two within the ordinance. So in our planning code, we generally, there is a correlation between the planning department going to the planning board for approval or, you know, some type of collaboration um, that is required. I didn't see where, based on this, it's they, they should go to that committee. Am I misreading? And it's and it's actually in there because I couldn't find it. No. Um, do you see? Okay. Do you see? I'm not sure if I'm expressing myself There's the right way. The, one of the next items is actually the um, act to establish the committee. Right. And the committee would only be advisory to the council, and and would also be made available to the planning board to talk about, you know, when there's an inquiry of somebody from the list that triggers site plan. Um, but the property owner would not need to go directly to... to yeah, I wasn't thinking of the property owner's uh, ability to go to the committee. It was whether or not the town is required to go to the committee before going to the planning board. There's no mention of the relationship in, in anywhere in the ordinance. I understand that the resolution will establish the committee. I'm just suggesting is that there's nothing says that the town planning department has to go to the committee to get their advice. I don't see it in the I don't see it in the ordinance. I think that was done by design in that it was really set up to make sure it could be administratively uh, administered going forward. So we have the list of 48 or 50 that will be a modified presumably over time, but it's the planning department as an administrative function will refer to that list and if in fact a property is on it, then it it, uh, you move on to the next. Uh, and, and furthermore, this implementation committee was not envisioned to be a standing forever kind of committee. So I think it would have, this, given its current composition or proposed composition and mandate, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to recognize it because it's not going to exist forever, uh, whereas the ordinance will survive it. Does that make sense? It does. And actually, that, that leads into a second question. But okay. I think that the chairwoman may have an answer to my question. Maybe. Is, it, is there a reference in there and I just missed it? Yeah. Okay, do, can you just tell me where it was? Sure. Um, it's not page numbered, so I was trying to, um, but it's the section. 
the, the section two, I mean, um, make a perusal, 406 subdivision ordinance. Okay. The, the sub, the, because of the nature of how site plan, it's when they subdivide, that's when it sure. triggers. Yep. And yes, it's in there that they, okay. they that um, the way it's written, sorry, let me pull that back up. No, I, I can look at that. You um, the ball. In number two, it just says um, the planning, because I just, I looked. I just couldn't find it. But that's planning my fault. Planning board, planning department, applicant may consult with the State Historic Preservation Office, the Scarborough Historic Society, or similar organization. So it's a similar organization. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the second the second question or comment that I had was about the permanency of such a committee because I think that there is. While I understand that this is temporary and it's an implementation, I do hope that we consider making the historical preservation a permanent committee, advisory committee within our town. Um, once it has been fully implemented, so I wanted to see the stages of how that we might get there. So that's why I was looking for the reference to the relationship within the document. Thank you. Okay, yes, vote from you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, is there anybody else that wishes to, to ask? I just, I'd just like to come back to the, uh, the point about how properties get on the list. Now, the list was created by the by the committee through tons and tons of research and so on and so forth. Um, but were the property owners notified that they were on the, going to be on the list? Were they, were they asked whether they wanted to be on the list or not? We hosted um, a owner's meeting right here actually in council chambers, although it was it lightly attended, but anybody that was a candidate on the list did receive a letter through, um, I believe it was the planning department, Dan, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so there was outreach to to the owners. But did the owners come back and say, hey, girly, I want to be on the list? Uh, to date, I've had nobody say they didn't want to be on the list, but certainly the committee has always had the position of if somebody really, truly just didn't want to be on the list, then be happy to remove them. <laughs> we didn't insist on getting like a written confirmation that yes, uh, I want to be on the list, and I think that's partially due to the fact that the approach taken here is really incentive-laden. Mm. There's no requirement. It really would not be in someone's, I don't know why they would be opposed to mm. uh, having their structure included. In fact, it, it may even open up some opportunities for development. It, it certainly doesn't bar them from doing whatever they wish with the property. Mm. Much better answer, Tom. Thank you. So additions <laughs> so in the future are going to be handled the same way. The committee is going to take a look at the properties that they went by the first first time and pick another three or four or something like that. And the I'm sure they'll go out to the property owners, we want to put you on the list, and but if the property owner doesn't come back, they put it on the list, right? <laughs> yeah, correct. No I was, yeah. Um, there was in the recommendation of the report, it's a self-nomination moving forward. So if they would like to be on the list, then they can be. They, they can be. Um, but, but they would submit that to, to the committee. Or actually, technically, it would be to Todi in the clerk's office and then provided to the committee. <laughs> but and then ultimately, it would be the sitting council at the time to adopt it. To adopt it would it. actually change the ordinance, I suppose, to add properties. Is that yep. right? There's not likely to be brisk activity in the near future to add properties, um, given the level of research mm -hmm. and evaluation done. Um, as was suggested, you know, in 20 years there might be then historic properties that aren't now, but uh, there's not likely to be swift movement and mm -hmm. lots of properties coming onto this, you know, in the next five or seven years, I suspect. Mm -hmm. How many properties are on commercial land? Do you have any idea? Oh. Um, Dan, would you be able to possibly? I, I don't have an exact number, but in terms of proportions, I'd say a third are commercial and two thirds are residential. I mean, we can run down and give you a more precise no, answer, no, but I'm that's. Curious. I mean, I say that in particular because Dun the Dunstan area, mm -hmm. uh, Route 1 in Dunstan has, um, I would say that's a cluster of historic properties um, for the community, and a number of those are commercial. That's that's 
by and large the biggest cluster of commercial properties. Other than that, they're largely residential. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But I would say two thirds, one third, one third being the commercial. Were you all set? Yep. Thanks. Henry? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I I like this approach to the preservation of historic properties. Um, having dealt with Portland's Historic Preservation Board, where it's required that you do all of these things, and you got to make sure mm. that if you replace windows, if you're in a historic district, you got to get permission, and the yada yada yada. That can be very restrictive on pe on people on the way they own their properties, and and um, so I like this approach much better. So. Thank you. And anybody else wish to speak? Well, I don't think it'll come as a big surprise that I'm going to support it. But um, again, I do just want to say, um, again, express my gratitude to the committee members. I, I, again, I think they've done an excellent job of, of again, that, that partnership of working with an owner rather than, you know, really forcing or demanding of an, of an owner. Um, so hopefully this, again, helps um, with the burden of maintaining one of our unique and charming historic homes here, here in Scarborough. So um, with that, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay. So the next item is Resolution 15-002, which is act on the request to establish a Standing Historic Preservation Implementation Committee. Okay. And does anybody wish to speak on this item? All right. And seeing none, I will close the comment. And this will be in the form of a motion. Be it resolved by the Town Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, and Town Council assembled that whereas the Town Council does hereby recognize the importance of historic preservation within the Town of Scarborough, and it is important to preserve the historic quality of the town for future generations to learn about and enjoy. And whereas on April 17, 2013, the Town Council approved Resolution 13-02, establishing the Ad Hoc Historic Preservation Advisory Committee, charged to craft a town-wide plan for preserving the historic, historical pieces and places that can be used as a guide for future reference. Now, therefore, be it hereby resolved by the Town Council of the Town of Scarborough and the Town Council assembled that with its work completed, the Ad Hoc Historic Preservation Advisory Committee recommends to the Town Council to establish a Historic Preservation Implementation Committee to preserve the town's historical footprint. Now, therefore, be it further resolved by the Town Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, and Town Council assembled, and the Town Council does hereby establish the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee, and its charge shall be as follows. One, its purpose. The purpose of the committee is to serve as an advisory committee to the Town Council regarding historic preservation for the Town of Scarborough and to implement the final report and recommendations from the Ad Hoc Historic Preservation Advisory Committee. Two, its duties. The committee shall have the following duties concerning historic preservation. Review and consider planning efforts. Develop further recommendations for the Town Council provide an annual report to the council and oversee, encourage, coordinate, and carry out as appropriate preservation efforts and activities including creating in consultation with the town manager, task-specific working groups, and as appropriate, at least annually, reviewing and making recommendations to the town council regarding the list of historic sites in ordinances and elsewhere and advising the town council, planning board, and other boards and committees and town staff <coughs> regarding historic preservation issues that come before them, and maintaining an up-to-date watch list of historic properties, the preservation of which may be or, in the near future, may become uncertain. The membership, the committee shall be compromised of five members. One member shall be the town council member appointed as liaison to the committee. All remaining appointments will be made by the town council. Terms of these four members will be for two years and will expire on December 31st. The initial appointments will be two, with terms expiring December 31st, 2016, and two terms expiring December 31st, 2017. Vacancies and removals. Any vacancy shall be filled by the Town Council. The Town Council may remove any member of the committee by vote of majority of its members for misconduct or non-performance of duty. 
and five procedures, the three members of the committee shall constitute a quorum. Every action by the committee shall require the concurrence of three members. The committee shall select one of its members to serve as chair and another member who shall serve as recording clerk and keep the minutes of all proceedings and submit these to the town clerk's office for filing. The committee shall set its own meeting schedules, which will be open to the public. Signed and sealed this 18th day of March 2015 on behalf of the Scarborough Town Council and the town manager of Scarborough, Maine. And that was in the form of a motion. Is there Second. And any discussion? All right, and seeing none, and now that I'm out of breath, all those in favor, <laughs> that is unanimous. <coughs> so, there is no old business at this time, so we will move right into new business, which is order number 15-019, first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 302, the Town of Scarborough Town Council Rules, Policies, and Procedures Manual, as recommended by the Rules and Policies Committee. And um, what I will do is, before we take public comment, not that I think there's droves of people hopping up and down, um, if we could, I believe, uh, if Bill, if you wanted to maybe just kind of introduce this item to us. Thank you. Uh, the Rules and Policy uh, Committee met several times. Councilors uh, Katarina and Hayes and myself, town manager Tom Hall, uh, joined us. Uh, it was a good work sessions, and uh, we addressed uh, uh, couple of items and I'll review them briefly for you. Uh, uh, the first was, uh, uh, neither of these are terribly huge uh, issues, but uh, it was, they were important enough for us to uh, feel that some additions and corrections were appropriate. Uh, the first was uh, related to appointments to town boards and committees. Uh, uh, it is evident to a number of us that uh, from time to time, uh, a newly appointed board member or committee member finds that the arrangement is not exactly what they expected it to be, uh, uh, that uh, their schedules don't uh, uh, jive with allowing them to uh, attend the meetings or the manner in which uh, the uh, actions and uh, tasks of the committee actually take place just don't fit well with them. The same with committees sometimes people just don't uh, fit in well. Uh, it was deemed appropriate to add a provision that said uh, <coughs> the term for new appointees will be for one year. Uh, uh, and <coughs> therefore, give the opportunity to a person or a committee to make a judgment as to whether or not this is working before they uh, sign themselves up for a three-year term, which is the customary uh, length of, of time. Uh, I will make a motion to this once uh, the uh, matter is moved and seconded. Uh, 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 Craig Frederick made a suggestion that I think is a good suggestion uh, to add words at the end of that addition that says, unless otherwise determined by the town council, and so that if people uh, who are known to the appointments committee and, and uh, already appreciate what they're getting into, uh, uh, should present themselves to the, if the appointments committee wishes to make a recommendation to us, and we, uh, in turn, acting upon it, uh, uh, may uh, immediately just uh, pass on the one-year requirement and go to three years. So that's the uh, uh, change with uh, relative to the appointment to committees. The decorum uh, issue 202.3a is a is a desire to maybe be more articulate in uh, what we expect for behavior and decorum uh, at our town meetings. Uh, the previous provisions were, were pretty sparse in terms of the language that was used, and we thought it would be good to uh, uh, clarify uh, uh, what uh, was specifically expected of people, to clarify the authority of the chair, to uh, take appropriate action. Uh, and so we have in turn um, uh, reviewed Portland's, uh, Brunswick, and Freeport's language. None of them really seemed to be exactly what we wanted. But nevertheless, from it, it gave us uh, some ideas as to language that all three committee members uh, strongly supported. 
and felt was appropriate. So that what we have done here is essentially two things. Uh, we have added a provision that requires anyone who's addressing the council to direct their remarks to the chair uh, and not to any individual in the audience or any individual who they might want to get into an argument with uh, uh, who is a council member. Uh, and that's really just to uphold the dignity of the proceeding. Uh, uh, and that allows the chair to manage uh, uh, public hearings uh, in an appropriate way. We also use some language that we attempted to uh, describe the kinds of personal or rude or <coughs> provocative remarks that really are intended to uh, 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 only disrupt the proceeding and, and shouldn't be tolerated. So those, uh, uh, those came out of uh, a review of these other ordinances which were more explicit than ours has, uh, has previously been. So those are the two, uh, uh, the two changes that are proposed by uh, the Rules Committee. Thank you, Bill. And is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this matter? And going, going. All right. Close public comment and pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. Second All right. And uh, move to uh, uh, amend. Okay. Uh, uh, by uh, adding the words to follow the uh, proposed additional language, quote, the term for new appointees will be for one year. Uh, the amendment will be to add the words. Uh, unless otherwise determined by the town council. And I will second. second. And discussion on the amendment. All right. And seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, and that's unanimous. So back to the main motion and discussion. I think, Sean. Um, thank you. I was actually my. I was going to actually do the amendment for you, but I'm glad you were on top of that. Um, I, I think. Um, one is very nice. It does at least allow for that review, and I think it's a nice change regarding the one-year appointment rather than two or three. And, and that way, if you need to back up for whatever reasons, um, that's really nice. Um, I think the bigger issue here is uh, Section 202.3, and I'm in full support of it. We live in a society now that people believe that they can just be flat-out rude to everybody. And I think that when we're in this chamber, we're not rude to each other, and we should not be talked to rudely by others, and we should not talk to other people rudely. And so we have seen an example, at least in the one, since I've been back, I know of uh, once, and I know and have seen historically that um, others have done that in the past too. So I think this is a great move forward so that it's clear and known. So I appreciate the work of the committee. And anybody else wish to speak on this item? All right. I just offer one piece of clarification. Oh. There was, uh, I would refer to it as a Scribner's error. Uh, there was a parenthetical um, word impolite in the draft you see before you. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. Uh, that was really meant to be a word choice, and I, rude and impolite, I believe, are interchangeable. So um, I would suggest we just simply remove the, the parenthetical impolite so rude will remain. That was just an oversight on our Thank part. You, and Thank just you. a further point I want to clarify, though it's not in front of you, the companion to the uh, changes to the appointment is the actual application uh, that Tody uses, and we've um, chosen to improve that in a couple of different ways. We've encouraged the attachment of a resume or other background-like information, so the ordinance, excuse me, the appointments committee has a better sense of the candidates that are before them. And we also are making candidates aware that we uh, we may well do some search of publicly available records um, uh, about their candidacy. Uh, again, just kind of disclaimers. We're certainly not doing background checks, but. I think these are two very good improvements to the application form and ought to really ensure that we've got good candidates and, and match them well with uh, our needs. Madam Chair, just for clarification, because we were handed a, uh, a new version when we walked in, and I just want to make sure, because that, that was the version I thought was being... I beg your pardon. So, I, it, so that impolite was already deleted, mm -hmm. and they actually included or provocative remarks. That was in the so I just want to make sure that's the yeah, one that we... Okay. All right. I just want to clarify which I want to make sure that we're voting on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The second word's important. <laughs> Impolite's nice, too. <laughs> Double negative. And Ed. Uh, just one quick question on the appointments. If we're going to appoint for a year, normally isn't a person appointed for a term, either, you know, filling out a three-year term or a two-year term? 
how is the one year assignment going to go along with the terms? Because you usually, on a lot of boards, you have terms for three years, and you got three people here, two people there, three people there. I think is this going to foul things up, or are we not going to worry about that? Uh, it potentially will throw off the, the intentional staggering of terms to make sure you have consistency on committees, but I think that's something we can be mindful of and work toward. Uh, clearly, the goal is to make sure a committee has, has adequate numbers to be able to function. Um, but you may be right. There may be some sputtering initially in terms of um, um, the staggering being thrown off a bit. But I, I think if we're on top of it, we'll be able to manage it. I think if if a, if a person is going to be nominated to a three-year term, it should be nominated to the three-year term with the first year being on probation or whatever you want to call it. And then if it doesn't work out, you appoint somebody to the remainder of the term, which is done all the time, right? We do that all the time. Somebody will leave and you you fill out a two-year term or something? If somebody leaves, we do no. fill the remainder term if there's a candidate. So you might, you might be able to just do it like that and not worry about it. What do you think, Tom? Well, it, it may well be that the appointments committee chooses to continue to recommend uh, three-year terms. Um, and this is an opportunity for a candidate who is hesitant or wondering whether they'll like it. Uh, so the exception might be the one-year term. I, I think that um, the way this is worded, it gives the authority to the appointments committee in their recommendation of the council. So it may well be that you continue to see three-year terms being recommended. That's a good point. That's a good point. I, I meant to note that Tom was picking up some of the, the details uh, that we also discussed and uh, recommending that the rules of decorum be more clearly posted uh, in the chamber so that uh, people just are more aware of it. Uh, and we expect that we may try to come up with some uh, summary language that may be able to assist chairs in the future as to uh, uh, being able to remind the members of the public in advance of, a pub, uh, of the, at the beginning of the meeting that uh, there are rules of decorum that we expect them to be. All right. Anybody else? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. On to the next item will be order number 15-020, first reading and schedule a second reading on the bond order for the 2015 municipal and school capital improvement product project. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on this matter? Right up to the podium, name and address in three minutes. Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. I won't need three minutes and I won't be rude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the information that's going to be presented for these bond uh, issues that are coming up on this item. Will that be made available to the public so that people can look at this and study it before the second reading down the road? Sure, the information was available uh, as part of the agenda packet, but it, we have copies here that I can share with you as well. Beautiful, I'd appreciate that. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I'm curious, what is the town debt at this time? I, I, I imagine you pay it down a little each month, right? Just like I pay my mortgage down, or you pay it quarterly. But do we have an idea of what that debt stands at now? It was approaching a hundred million dollars, I think, at one time. Uh, that that is my concern. Uh, I do believe that in a past meeting somewhere along the line, uh, the town manager has mentioned that uh, I think it's called the debt ratio that we are within acceptable limits, mm -hmm. uh, but still the debt in itself scares me. And I just lay awake and think of the things that we could do with the money that we use to service the debt every month. And I fear that we'll just continue to grow more debt instead of get rid of the debt we have. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, do you by any chance, Tom, know, know the 
debt total number to date, or is that something we'd need to? Right, no numbers off the top of your head. <laughs> I believe this would put it over 100 million. I can't be. Give the no, Ruth's shaking her head. Why don't I refer to the finance director? Oh, okay. hey, well, who's sitting in the audience? <laughs> Hi, Ruth Porter, finance director. <laughs> <laughs> At June 30th, our outstanding debt was approximately 98 million dollars. Uh, we paid down some of that this year. I don't have the number right off the bat, but it's around probably the six million that we're also looking to to borrow again. So we're probably going to stay probably right around the 98 million. Thank you very much, Ruth. All right. So is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this item? And seeing none, we'll close the public comment and pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. And uh, can I, I'm sorry, you're, you're too quick on the draw. I was going to distribute a. a a new version, and I wanted to explain uh, what amounted to be an oversight uh, on our part in terms of the bond order in front of you. Yep, they have some this way. So the the, uh, the item that uh, was on your agenda included something just over six million dollars, six million eighty-five thousand dollars. That is, in fact, the total amount that we are looking to bond in, in this spring bond issue. Um, some portions of that money have already been authorized by a prior council. Um, in fact, it's the, it's the final four items, if you will. It's about $2 million of it. So it's the school projects for 2012 and 13, school projects for 10 and 11, municipal projects for 9 and 10, and the final one is the Benjamin Farm money way back from 2003 and 4. Um, so it was an oversight on our part. We do not need additional authorization. A prior council has already granted that. Uh, but in fact, that total amount of six million eighty-five thousand will be the total amount that we go to uh, issue this spring. Um, and that's a great example of how these projects, though they've been approved by a prior council and authorized for, for borrowing, things happen over time and the projects don't happen. Uh, land conservation is a great example of that. So in fact, what I just distributed just now uh, provides the total, uh, which is four million twenty-eight thousand, for which we seek bond authorization. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. So uh, I'm not sure procedurally how you want to do that. Whether you could rescind or you wish to have the motion uh, withdrawn by the person making the motion. I think it'd be best. And then if you would reconsider it uh, with the new amount. Yeah. All right, so does everybody retract their first and second? Love yes. to. Okay. <laughs> and do we have a motion to replace with the document in front of us? To approval. Second. All right. So discussion on the document in front of us. So just for the, I mean, the citizens don't get to see the document in front of us, but yes. just to, uh, on the dollar value, just to be clear, that the request now is for $4.028 million. Um, I think it's really important to uh, um, inform a couple of things. One is we're kind of coming into this as um, this is the way that it's always happened. Now, not that it's bad, but it can be better. And I've talked to a couple of finance committee members and um, I think that going forward, and I've talked to, I should say I talked to at least one, but also with the, um, the town manager, um, that what we would like to do is actually vet the, um, in the future, not these, but in the future, vet the um, capital improvements or the bonding items, really because we have an executive and an administrative oversight responsibility, not necessarily to justify whether or not something should be funded because Unlike state government, um, if the voters approve something and the prior town councils approve something, we're going to approve it and not withhold the bonds. Um, but we do have a responsibility. We do have a responsibility to at least look at the terms and the conditions of those bonds, so to make sure that computers aren't being bonded for 30 years when they should be one or two, or you know, or a truck should be five or seven and not 20. So we do have that responsibility. So I do want you to know that um, I did approach the manager. That's definitely something that we can do going forward in the new cycle. Um, but for the citizens, to keep in mind that this bonding, um, these are everything that the councils before us approved. Um, I don't believe any of this, at least none of this was approved during my tenure. So uh, all we're doing is fulfilling the prior council's obligations and promises that they made to the community. And that's why I'm uh, um, in favor of the request that's being made tonight without further evaluation. Anybody else? 
Peter. Well, I think, I think what I'd like to add, and actually, I think we have had conversations. This is a great conversation to talk about how we approach this going forward. And I, and I think to kind of dovetail on the comment that we heard from the public is as we think about there's really two costs to the taxpayers of things we're doing. It's the operating budget we approve every year, which is in your current tax rate. But these type of things, the CapEx budget, really represent future liabilities and future costs. So there's really two components to what we're asking taxpayers to commit to. It's the operating budget every year plus the impact of what we do approve for CapEx. And I'd like to find a way that we can share what that impact is. And so recently we there was a yardstick that was developed that for about every $2 million of expenditures, it impacts taxpayers by about $300 on the average household. So when you think about this $6 million CapEx, that's a $900 impact over the life of the bonds that is a future liability to taxpayers. So I think it's important for us to find ways that we communicate what our combined spending is. It's your operating budget plus the CapEx that we approve. And I think We've had a conversation about can we do a better job of sharing that with all of you at home and constituents so you know what we're really approving each year as far as current um, tax liabilities you're going to have in the current tax year plus what future liabilities might be for all the capital expenditures that are approved at the same time. And um, I have questions as to why are we approving this at this point in time. Why wouldn't we approve this at the time of our budget? I mean, this is this is an impact on our budget. So now, if we approve this tonight, this is a given, right? Yeah, all of these have either uh, voter approval or prior budget uh, approval by way of a prior council. And at the time well, of that, we haven't spent any of the money yet. Well, as a matter of fact, most of these projects uh, have been bought and paid for using town funds, and we end up reimbursing ourselves with bond proceeds. But that, that's beside the fact, I suppose. But uh, at the time of budget approval, and most of these items will be seen through the capital budget as opposed to operating, um, we do indicate, and part of your approval gives staff the nod as to how to finance these items. Some capital items are actually appropriated money, money so tax, the tax rate does raise funds for capital items. Most of capital items end up being financed for some period or another. In fact, some of the items on this list um, are to be financed for a year, others as long as 20 years, depending on the type of item it is. So uh, I think it's important for the council to take this action, as Councilor Babine said, there are a lot of particulars relative to the actual bond issue in terms of length of term, uh, and that's really what this is all about, is the council giving a final blessing to staff based on this recommendation that uh, uh, this borrowing is appropriate to fulfill the prior obligation made. <coughs> all set? No. Anybody else? Bill? Uh, just so that people out there will understand, uh, uh, CapEx is just a, a, a shorthand way of saying capital expenditure, just so you'll you realize. Yeah. These are all capital assets that have different uh, useful lives, mm -hmm. uh, and the bonds are then arranged so as to be paid off consistent with the life of the asset. Trucks have longer lives than computers. Buildings have longer lives than trucks. So th that's all part of the process that uh, goes on, but I just wanted the public to realize we're talking about capital assets uh, being bonded and nothing else. Anybody else? Just a final piece. I know I've talked to a couple of counselors on the Finance Committee and, and I think this is a great subject for one or more future Finance Committee meetings, maybe post-budget. Uh, we're going to be busy over the next yeah. month or so, six weeks. Uh, but we have a consultant that assists us in this uh, effort and I think the, the concern we heard from the podium is one that I think we're all sensitive to, that uh, let's understand what our total debt load is and how we can really manage that going forward. Um, I think financing long-term debt uh, is viable and an essential part of uh, running an operation of this size. Uh, but I think we also have to have some conversation around how to do that within our comfort. So I'd be pleased to set that up um, as soon as we get through some of the budget process. Oh, yeah. 
All right. So, any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. All right, so the next item, order number 15-021, act on the request to amend the disposition of tax-acquired property policy as recommended by the Rules and Policy Committee. And again, um, we'll go ahead and look the bill to go ahead and just introduce this item to us. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the uh, uh, foreclosure and redemption process has been the subject of discussion before the board previously. Uh, we uh, have a long list of properties that have been foreclosed upon by the town and uh, our town manager has said uh, they've been sort of passed over and not uh, no actions really been taken to dispose of them so uh, uh, and we had some anomalies where people missed it and the foreclosure took place uh, uh, and uh, our present law has a provision for residential properties that uh, are owner occupied uh, whereby arrangements can be made for a payment plan. Uh, well, there are more than just that set of circumstances that are necessary uh, to, to deal with uh, that kind of unusual situation where uh, some, uh, some arrangements should be made. Uh, I think the way the Rules and Policies Committee came at it was that uh, we did not want to be taking properties of substantial value, uh, uh, substantial equity, where it was inadvertent and uh, there was an opportunity for the uh, owner to uh, pay us back everything that uh, we put into the process of foreclosing. Uh, and kind of a last opportunity, 90 days uh, at the conclusion of the foreclosure upon notice that's one last time uh, a chance to get it back. So uh, uh, it's uh, what I think, based on what we've learned, a generous policy compared to what other municipalities have, but we didn't think we ought to be in the business of taking people's equity when uh, there's just a lot of circumstances that can arise uh, and make it difficult for people. So while this is not an open-ended arrangement that's being proposed, it nevertheless does expand in the area of non-residential or residential properties that are not owner-occupied. Uh, and essentially provides for a 90-day period of time post-foreclosure, after we own it, when the former property owner acknowledges that we do own it, that they can get the property back uh, by deed from us, no warranties, of course, uh, uh, with it by making a full uh, and complete payment within 90 days. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for giving the introduction to that. So uh, at this time, we will take public, com public comment on this matter. Is there anyone that wishes to speak? Name, address, and three minutes, please. Um, Madam Chair, members of the Council, uh, my name is Rick Shanae. I live at 9 Hampton Circle here in Scarborough. I'm not here on behalf of any particular client, although those of you who participated in the workshop on this a month or so ago know the circumstances um, involving the property of Mr. Pio and my client, the uh, Catholic Foundation. I simply want to thank uh, the manager and those of you who have worked on this to develop a, a mechanism that gives us the opportunity, gives former property owners the opportunity to get their property back. I read this as creating a case-by-case -case basis and the owner will have to come and, and make their case to the council that their particular property should be put into this Article 4 process, the, uh, the buyback process, if you will. It doesn't mandate that that happen, but it opens up an opportunity that wasn't in the uh, policy before and it gives the manager some, some latitude working with the council to do that. So um, to the extent our situation uh, precipitated uh, the policy committee looking at this and working on it and the manager working hard to develop it. We appreciate it very much and look forward to you passing it and then hopefully we can move through the process on our particular situation. So again, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment and pleasure of the council. So moved. Second. Right. And discussion. 
on. So, um, a couple of questions that come to mind. Um, Council Donovan mentioned that once an owner has acknowledged that the town owns the property, if you have an un unresponsive owner, how is that acknowledgement accepted or how is that defined? Um, well, I, that certainly is a circumstance that uh, we're not unfamiliar with. Yeah. We have an unresponsive mm. uh, taxpayer. Um, I'm not exactly sure if we need acknowledgement, but to the extent we can make contact with the prior owner, we wouldn't be even considering this, I guess, if we couldn't. I think they would, we'd, we'd look for some confirmation on their part, just acknowledgement that we own it. I don't think we necessarily need it, but um, we would look for that. And, and it really is initiated by the town contacting them, and, and I think we may have to use all means possible, not just certified and registered, which are required here, are certified in, in uh, regular U.S. mail, mm -hmm. uh, we may also uh, knock on the front door. Um, it's, it's remarkable to me, but um, many folks choose not to view their oh, mail or... Sure. So th through right. the... Ch let, me, let me just add Please. to Tom's comments that uh, uh, we don't want people to show up and present uh, uh, and, and say, well, you know, I'd maybe like to take advantage of this, but I'm doing it under a reservation of rights that you may not have done the foreclosure properly. Uh, and so it's really just a condition of if you want to talk to us, <laughs> you've got to acknowledge that the foreclosure has given us okay. uh, 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 title. So that's really why that was Good in point. Was, uh, and if, of course, we get, if it's a non-responsive owner, then so be it, that's fine, and we'll just go and we'll uh, uh, provide the uh, town manager with the authority to do a public sale, as mm -hmm. the provision presently provides, uh, under the best terms available to the town. Mm -hmm. So, um, th and that's a nice segue, so thank you, and it's a nice segue into the second part of what um, I wanted to understand better, and that is that um, while this solves an immediate issue with one particular um, resident, um, the question I have is what changes our behavior to make sure that it's followed? and that we started um, um, disposing of this tax-acquired property because every council and every town manager before us and probably even after us are nervous when we get into this situation because you are dealing with, you know, um, residential rights. Uh, you know, it's a very sensitive subject. I just want to know how is this going to change so that going forward we follow the rule and that we're getting rid of the property after 90 days. I don't care if it's 90, 120, or even two years. Um, what changes our behavior to make sure that we're not back into the situation where we have another 30, 50 mm -hmm. properties because things are going to get tighter and tighter with our residents? Yeah, excellent point, and I'll accept responsibility, uh, though I've inherited most of these. But excellent. Yeah, no. I share in the responsibility. I think, to answer your question, uh, I'm committed to working through the current backlog, which is something in the order of 20 properties. and. Uh, I've had conversations with the Rules and Policies Committee and we'll be making formal recommendations to the full council as to how to dispose of those. Some may fall under this Article 4, yeah. others they're already in an installment payment arrangement, others I'll be recommending right. we sell or dispose of somehow. So um, that is likely to be a, a fairly lengthy process to kind of work through that backlog and then it's going to require annual commitment. Um, luckily we don't take you know, there's not more than two or three or four properties a year. So if we can stay on clear it, we should be able to stay mm -hmm. on top of it going forward. And, and Matt, just a last comment. I, I don't want people to perceive that this is a money grab because the value of land in Scarborough is extremely valuable. I mean, I pay my taxes. Everyone pays, you know, most everyone pays their taxes. Everyone should pay their taxes. I think the town is, is you know, um, obligated, if not, has a right to at least get that tax money. I'm not looking for the equity. I just want the tax money that we're due and we're promised as, as part of that deal. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, every single one of the tax acquired properties should be sent a notice that says you have one time, you can get back your property right now, just give us our taxes and you can get the deed. It cleans it up. But that's, you know, town manager's responsibility, not mine. I'm just saying. It's time to clean it up and everybody do what they're supposed to do. And I think going forward we can manage it like that. Uh, part of the problem is w we have some on this, on, on this list, if you will, from 1957. So finding a prior owner uh, might be a little challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? No. All right. Well.
that leaves me with me. I'm, I'm really glad to see that, that you guys have made such great progress taking a step forward. Um, realistically, it sounds like you know there's a likelihood that everybody will have kind of a, a one-shot clean out the back lot. I did chuckle the first time I looked at your list and saw the 1957 one that we've we've had for how long. Um, so it'll be nice, like I said, clean slate, move forward, and have this new policy coming forward so that there's a clear direction of how we handle these going into the future. Um, so with that, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. On to the next thing is um, order number 15-15. 022, act on the following request pursuant to Title 23, MRSA 3025, and the requirements of Section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance. A, from Wegman, Compa from Wegman Companies to accept the public infrastructure of the off-site improvements in Black Point Road and accept the right-of-way parcel, access, and sidewalk easements as recommended by the Planning Board. B, from Scarborough Property Holdings, LLC, and Scarborough Capital Partners, LLC, to accept the public infrastructure of the off-site improvement in Gin Road. And is there anyone that wishes to speak on this matter? And, saying none, pleasure of the council. Who approval. Second. And any discussion? Peter? Yeah, can someone, uh, I tried to understand, A, um, what exactly are we doing there? Is it getting some, an easement and some sidewalks? Is, I couldn't tell from the. Stand lost, but you want to take a crack? Yeah, with respect to, so just trying that to one, I'm, the I'm, map, trying I'm trying to, to recall out. exactly what they did. I know they did some road widening uh, along their section of Black Point Road, and I think there is a sidewalk that runs along yeah, the entirety of their ownership mm -hmm. as well. Um, so generally speaking, as part of the planning board approval process, yeah. there are certain improvements that were proposed uh, to become public improvements okay. once they completed it. And that's what's in front of you. The <coughs> council must accept them, formally accept them, and that's what this action does. Okay. So we're, we're satisfied that what they committed to do, they've done. Yes. The town engineer is, is inspected, um, okay. and, and they've been certainly built within uh, accordance with our standards. Okay. Great. Right. Any other questions or discussion on this item? Oh, and then the follow-up question just on B, it looks like we're just getting a small parcel of land. Was that for a sign or on the Scarborough Property Holdings LLC. It looks like we're accepting a small sliver of land. I think that was for some type of traffic. Yeah, it's 312 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was something so they could widen that road or something, and we needed that for maybe the, tele the lights or something. So anyway, so but we're picking up. Someone's given us 300 square feet of land, so we're able to do something. Is that I think they did it as part of their requirements, but uh, we are now accepting it as public improvements. I, I beg your pardon, I just don't know what okay, right. physically what they did to it, but um, okay. I can find out for you. No, thank you. Anybody else? Um, <coughs> and all those in favor? Not as unanimous. Moving forward, order number 15-023, act on the request from Vacation Land Dog Club, Inc. and the York County Kennel Club for a mass gathering permit for the AKC sanctioned dog show. The Southern Maine Coastal Classic, located at Wasomsee Springs Campground, scheduled for Thursday, May 14th through <coughs> Sunday, May 17th. And what a nice thing to see, because that means spring is coming <laughs> when, they, when they have their application in. So um, is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? And seeing none, pleasure of the council. So moved. Second. Second. And any discussion? Questions? Jim Marine. Uh, I know I don't live all that far from Wasomski, but I'm always aware of when the dog uh, club's doing their shows and they've got all sorts of cool things I guess they do over there. Uh, I just think it's great. It brings in a lot of people into Scarborough. I think it's a great use of those Wasomski Springs campgrounds. Um, and obviously I'm going to support this, but it's, I just think it's a great thing that they do over there. And anybody else? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Moving on to item number nine, the Standing and Special Committee reports and liaison reports. We'll go ahead and start with Sean. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for finance, uh, we held our last meeting. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's been a long week. I forgot. I think it was last week. <laughs> <laughs> Had a couple of meetings. 
the topic was solid waste um, planning for the town, and I, I really wanted to thank Mike Shaw um, as well as Kevin Roach, um, who came and spoke on behalf of EcoMain and gave us a very thorough presentation. We also, um, if you get a chance to watch it, we also had a representative from Waste Zero that came and talked and updated us, or presented at least to two new of us, two of us that are new, um, about the Pay As You Throw program and the opportunities that are available. Um, I will mention that the Finance Committee will um, continue looking at that and um, hopefully have some type of recommendation going forward on how to approach the discussion around that, whether it's part of this year's budget or as a future item. Um, we're going to kind of uh, uh, look at how we want that presented at the next meeting. Um, the next meeting primarily, by the way, the next meeting is um, the 24th, right? Yeah, 24th at 4 o'clock here in town chambers. Um, we have invited our county commissioner, Neil Jameson, who's from Scarborough, representing District 1, and the county manager, Peter Crichton, who's also a Scarborough resident, but they're going to be coming and talk to us about the county government and their impact on our budget over the past several years and where they're moving forward. And I did want to mention that um, the joint standing committee, um, kind of a workshop committee between the town council's finance and the school board's finance, in which both uh, Chris Siazzo and myself uh, chair together, um, we have um, um, set into our calendars that on April 29th at 7 p.m. Did I get that date right? Yes. Okay. Uh, my dates have been horrible lately. <laughs> April 29th at 7 p.m. at the high school auditorium, we will be holding a town hall open meeting in which we will be presenting the budgets um, at, the at a varying levels. Um, the council and the school board will do more of an executive presentation of the budgets while staff, including our town manager, finance director, superintendent, and the director of finance for the schools will be able to direct us and, and provide details around the budget and where the spending is um, heading this year. Uh, we'll also have other um, department heads available. Everyone is open. Um, it will serve as a public hearing, so there will be a section in which the council will, in fact, convene, take attendance, and then open it up for um, public hearings so that it can serve as that. Um, but it is going to be open. Again, it's in the high school auditorium. Um, and we will be making a presentation, um, or at least a paper presentation to you by email and hard copy about the rollout of that and what all of our roles are. And um, that's kind of getting formalized now. We're getting the pieces put together. Um, I also wanted to mention um, as a courtesy that um, Mr. Siazzo and I will be writing a uh, joint op-ed um, for the local papers, um, advertising that and, and kind of explaining what our intentions are and how we'd like to see that work and what our uh, expectations from that meeting um, will be. Um, it's going to be a very interactive process, by the way, in which uh, um, not only will people be able to submit their questions in advance through a dedicated email, but also um, be able to submit them um, there. And if they're not asked, then we'll keep record and we will answer everyone's questions over time. And um, I also, in the lead, one of the two liaisons to SEDCO, I just want to mention tomorrow is actually their board meeting um, at 7.30 a.m. And um, we haven't had a meeting in a couple months, so it's a, kind of a, a new agenda. But they are looking, by the way, at potential ordinances that involve Haggis Parkway um, and also other commercial zones that can help with small business, so, sorry, small batch processing plants. So it's a very exciting opportunity. I think I heard that we also have a guest speaker from the council, but I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure she will cover that. And I did want to mention Eco Maine, the other committee I serve. Uh, I d again, I want to thank Mike Shaw, who also serves as a uh, board member, and Kevin Roach. Um, you know, I got to tell you, I was on the council 10 years ago when um, this council in particular, but with the help of other communities, really dove into the relationship that we had with what was called RWS and. I just want to say that I think uh, Mr. Roach and the new board um, has come a long way. It's an incredible success story about municipal um, activism and good management and um, financial success that uh, really has put us being a primary owner of the company in uh, really good hands and for the great future because we have a lot of responsibility with them. So I want to thank him very much for that. And that's all my committees, Madam Chair. Bill? Uh, the uh, uh, finance committee that uh, Sean just reported on, we are going to be meeting every week uh, for pretty much the rest of the duration of the uh, budget season so that people should be aware that if they want to be able to stay current on what's going on with this uh, budget process, uh, we'll be here, uh, I guess, uh, I'm not quite sure, Thursdays at 4 
four to six, I think, is uh, is the schedule from here on out. Uh, the Energy Committee, uh, uh, which I'm a liaison to, uh, met uh, this morning. Uh, uh, we continue to talk about the municipal street lights uh, concept, and that uh, is in front of the PUC. The PUC was to have made ru done rulemaking uh, for that process by the end of December. They did not make that. Uh, deadline in February. They did not make that deadline either. It's now expected that by June uh, we will have rules in place that will tell us exactly how that process is going to work and the way in which the process works will dictate in substantial part uh, the uh, viability of this proposal from an economic point of view because uh, if you're going to buy the light fixture and Put LED, you know, low income, low, uh, uh, low usage uh, bulbs in there. You really have to know how much is it going to cost you to buy it, how much is it going to cost you to install it, and so there's a whole series of issues that need to be worked out before there's any viability to this idea. But we are uh, having the Energy Committee continue to pursue it. Uh, they also talked about uh, the solarized projects that are going on uh, on uh, the seacoast. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with that, that this is where a collective uh, 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 buy space and uh, 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 rules now exist that allow for not solar panels to just be on a person's roof or in their yard, but to be in other space owned collectively with others. And that, uh, that uh, process is being watched closely by the Energy Committee. Uh, South Portland High School has uh, uh, there's going to be a meeting there uh, this uh, this week on that. Uh, we also looked uh, doing an analysis of the energy consumption and efficiency uh, for town the town office the town building, uh, and we looked at some preliminary data, but expect that it will be uh, more refined at our next meeting. So it was a busy uh, active morning, uh, and uh, more to come on that in the future. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Um, I'll start with a short one, and that is we didn't have any conservation commission this month, so I've got nothing to report on on that. Uh, the next meeting will be in April. Um, I'm on the legislative policy committee for um, Maine Municipal Association, and we spend one day a month reviewing a good portion of the 800 bills <laughs> that are in front of the legislature at this time. Um, our, at our last meeting, um, we reviewed, oh gosh, a, a whole bevy of bills, but we've decided as a group to really concentrate on spending our so-called political capital on the governor's budget and how it's going to impact um, municipalities. Uh, it's been a very interesting group to work with because they're from all over the state. There's about 100 people, and they're you know, city managers, town managers, select people. Um, they run the whole gamut of elected officials to um, others. Uh, so that's been uh, very interesting, and I, um, as things come up, I'll, I'll keep you uh, posted. But right now, the governor's budget is it's in flux, as you probably read uh, in the paper, um, he does not have really good support for it, even across the board, from his, even from his own side, if you want to put it that way. So we have to, we have to be vigilant and paying attention to what's going to happen in what we call sausage making up there in the legislature. Uh, and I would encourage uh, anyone watching at home to stay in touch and to stay in touch with the legislators here in town and let them know because. One of the very probable outcomes of the budget will be an increase in property taxes uh, and a tax shift. So uh, we have to keep an eye on that uh, as, as uh, officials who are managing our town taxes here and trying to keep our taxes stable uh, for our citizens. Um, the municipal capacity bill that Scarborough presented did go to hearing and it didn't mm -hmm. seem to run into any uh, opposition and the Maine Municipal Association passed it. We are supporting it as MMA, so we should be all set with that. I also went to the Metro Regional Coalition uh, meeting um, on behalf of um, 
Mr. Hall uh, wasn't able to make it, and I'm happy to go to those. <laughs> uh, and again, what was the big discussion? Budgets. And what are we going to do? Um, also some talk about, you know, how can we be more efficient in working together as towns? I mean, that is one good thing the governor has talked about that um, I think towns could be doing more of, and I'll let Mr. Hall talk about some things that we've been looking at in his comments. Long-range planning, uh, Haggis Parkway, the small batch processing, which uh, uh, Sean mentioned. We've had meeting about the future of Dunstan. Uh, what are we going to do for planning down the line there? And also doing a public facilities inventory um, for, for the, the town. Um, and uh, when are we using them? When did, and when might they need replacing? Just to get more information uh, for for citizens on that. And yes, I am speaking at SEDCO tomorrow. I'll be speaking about uh, municipal revenue sharing, how that works, uh, and some of the current legislative legislative activity. That's it. <laughs> Ed. Uh, the Ordinance Committee uh, was scheduled to meet yesterday, but we had to cancel the meeting. And the next meeting will be on the 21st of April. Um, last Monday, the Planning Board hosted a Dunstan revitalization uh, meeting. It was a joint meeting with the Planning Board, SEDCO Board, and the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, and they basically just presented what has been done up at Dunstan uh, and some things that uh, are kind of being thought about at this point in time. Uh, not too much expansion is expected to take place in the near future until there's some sort of a decision made on a possible new exit to the turnpike just south of Scarborough, uh, because that, that's got a big impact on what you can do at Dunstan. If, if the traffic on Route 1 is going to continue to be as heavy as it is, doing further development up in Dunstan to slow down traffic is the wrong thing to do. We have another West Castle on our hands. Um, so with that in mind, uh, it was a very interesting meeting, a lot of new concepts, a uh, quasi-Main uh, Street effect, but it would have to be in the back. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and then the planning board uh, uh, held a public hearing on the zoning ordinance changes for the historical preservation of buildings and properties, uh, and basically the planning board sent back a positive uh, uh, note back to the, uh, the town council to go ahead and accept it. They agreed with it. Uh, the planning board also did a, a sketch plan review uh, for the proposed changes to the contract zone of Piper Shores. Um, and some discussion was made as to are we sure that the changes are only in the area that they can currently build in? And there were some people that had expressed concerns about this. A lot of people were expressing concerns about that because only because it was brought up one time and now everybody thinks it's going to be brought up. It's only the portion that uh, can be built on now and basically for New buildings, expansions of buildings. It's going to have an underground parking garage, uh, and everything is going to be right there where it is right now. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Ed. Peter? Good evening. Um, last Tuesday, March 10th, both the um, Shellfish Con Conservation Committee and Coastal Waters and Harbor met. Um, they have a lot of things in common, so I'll talk about those things first. The, the first <coughs> thing is there's going to be some repair work done to the boat landing at Clay Pits. There's some concrete slats that you drive on that are really 
corroded and there's a rebar sticking through, those are going to be replaced this spring as soon as they can. There's a day marker missing on one of the ledges out in the harbor that, that the pipe has kind of rusted and been removed that they're going to address and, and get fixed. They talked about this summer trying to have both at Ferry Beach and Pine Point some racks that will be available for people to leave their kayaks and canoes that people have been requesting. It'll be a rack system that they can rent a space and keep keep their things there instead of having to drag them off and off the top of cars. Um, then in particular for the um, shellfish conservation, they spent a lot of time working on a new shellfish ordinance as it relates to the main labor law. It needs to come to the council. I think they actually had a special meeting last night. Mm -hmm. I think they made progress, but we will be seeing that here, I would guess, next time. I hope so. That's the plan. Um, and then they, you know, as another sidebar, they're investing, at least the shell, they're going to invest some of their budget in new crab traps. Um, they have square, brown ones now. They're going to get some square ones. So. That's kind of it from, from my perspective. Thank you. Hey. <clears throat> so um, appointments committee did meet this evening at 6.30. We have some names to post for the next meeting. Um, the first one being um, Community Services Recreation Advisory Board. And it would be an appointment for Mr. S Liam Summers as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2016. And for the Energy Committee, there's an appointment for Mr. Allen as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2015, and I'm sorry, that was Ronald Allen. And um, just for the folks at home, we do have many, many vacancies w within our town committees, and um, if you are interested in serving, you can certainly, or offering some assistance, you can certainly go online and get an application, or please stop by um, the clerk's office and, and talk to Todi, and she'll be more than happy to more than happy to assist you. Um, we still have openings on the Board of Assessment Review. Coastal Waters and Harbor has a second alternate position available. Um, Conservation Commission still has openings, as well as um, the Housing Alliance, Housing Alliance and Parks and Conservation Land Board. Um, there's that right for you. And then Housing Alliance will be meeting um, this coming Thursday, March 20th at 6.30 p.m. Um, unfortunately, they had to cancel their last meeting, so this meeting is still for um, the appointment of officers and, 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 and those sorts of things. Um, next meeting, which will likely be its last, is the Historic Preservation Ad Hoc Committee. We'll have likely their last meeting Tuesday, April 7th um, at 6.30. And um, appointments will need to meet again as a committee prior to the next council meeting. We do have the audit scheduled for 6 p.m., I believe. Um, so if we can, we can meet as a group, 5.30, 5.45, we'll, we'll shoot, shoot out a reminder via toady. That's it for me, so on to the next item, which is town manager report. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple points of interest, uh, just to update the council, we can, I continue to work with the council chair uh, regarding the assessor appointment. Uh, at this point, we're doing background checks for the potential candidates. We have two candidates we've interviewed. Uh, we're also continuing to uh, evaluate the county regional option. That's a, certainly an important part of the process. And I've also explored kind of a third alternative, which is uh, kind of a shared services model, looking at neighboring communities as to whether there's any capacity to partner with them. Um, so uh, we're anxious to move through that, but by the same token, I want to make sure we make the right decision. So we're fully exploring all those options as we speak. Uh, right now, I'm fully engaged in budget. Uh, two weeks from tonight, I will present the budget to the council. Um, as I've reported in the past, we are changing the format in terms of how it's presented as a document, and I think it's going to be very good for the process. I can tell you it's, it's causing me fits right now, just converting to a new, new format, but I'm confident we'll get there. Uh, so I just kind of put that as a warning, I'll be quite preoccupied, if you will, over the next several weeks, so um, I'll do my best to respond to your, your needs, but uh, just be mindful that um, I am working in that direction quite a bit these days. Also a couple points of interest, um, I did have the chance to present to the residents of Piper Shores this week. Uh, I was asked to do a presentation that I provided to the Scarborough Chamber. Uh, it's always a great crowd, there, if any of you have met with folks, uh, the residents there, they're always very well informed, they're not shy about their <laughs> opinions, uh, but it's always a very interesting conversation and I, I very much enjoy it. I also attended the Scarborough Community Chamber Board meeting this week. Councillor Donovan was there as the liaison. 
Um, and I went there. I, I am an ex officio member of the board, though I must admit I'm not a terribly frequent attendee. But apparently at their last meeting last month, a number of questions came up, I think in new business or some such part of the meeting, uh, regarding the council's action, uh, the resolution regarding the governor's budget and the potential effects. And um, as you may expect, uh, the, the chamber group is interested in I'll say somewhat concerned, some of them regarding the even the, the hint of a local option sales tax. And so my my job was um, multifaceted, I suppose, but I, what I really wanted to do is convey and help them understand the context within which that was suggested. Um, and I, I promised them that should that ever come to pass, and I honestly don't expect it will in the near term, there would be a long, detailed local conversation and they would be central to that for certain. Just as an aside, I was interested. I, I looked at the 2014 retail sales numbers uh, just to appreciate, um, you know, the sales generated in, uh, in Scarborough, and it's it's quite impressive. We uh, we have over 480 million dollars of sales generated in town annually, um, and the the one thing that I was kind of uh, was surprising to me, I, I did uh, you know one percent of those sales. What does it mean? And it produces about $4.8 million, interestingly, almost the exact amount that we receive in GPA for education this year is, is what that number is. So I, I don't intend to do anything with that, but should this conversation go forward, I just wanted to have this stuff available. Um, so, and I'm pleased to share it around for other folks if you want to talk about it. And lastly, somewhat out of the blue, in fact entirely out of the blue, I received uh, an inquiry from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, earlier this week. Mm -hmm. They've requested an interest in meeting with us. <laughs> and so I'm now in the midst of arranging a time, uh, quite possibly next week, to meet with them. And they've not really indicated what their interest is other than they want to kind of pick up where the conversation left off about a year ago. So uh, we'll certainly keep uh, the, the council abreast of where those conversations go uh, as soon as I know more. Thank you, Tom. Good luck with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. <laughs> Council member comments. We'll start on the other end with Peter Hayes. Uh, I'm good. Thank right. you. Ed? By me. Wow. Hey. All right. <laughs> hey, Marie. Don't forget your clink bags, please. <laughs> <laughs> Even though winter's almost over, um, it, it provides a, an important service in this community to help people with their eating. Oil prices are down, so we can buy a lot more oil <coughs> with the money that you contribute. So don't forget to do that. That's it for me. Well, uh, happy belated uh, St. Patrick's Day to uh, everyone. Uh, those who are recovering from the binge, I made the serious mistake of trying to get into Reraz oh, that uh, night again. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just shows you what sort of judgment I have. Uh, and again, I, I missed the opportunity to wear anything green, and I, I was just uh, thinking, reflecting the fact that all of my great-grandparents were born in Ireland. No. All, all, all of them. Yeah. So uh, uh, I also want to offer congratulations to the Scarborough High School uh, boys hockey team, which was a long shot uh, to win the state championship and did, and that's usually a reflection of a team that d did not have a, a good seed in the tournament improving every every practice every day. And that's really a, quite an accom uh, accomplishment when you can uh, come from out of nowhere and, uh, and win the state championship. So congratulations to them. Sean. Uh, nothing tonight, thank you. All right. And um, I did just want to make a note um, for those of you, I'm not sure if we mentioned this at the last meeting or not, if we knew yet, but Project Grace with their fuel rally mm -hmm. um, was able to, right. to make the, the magic number to get the donor match. Um, so it was some really exciting news. And um, I do have some condolences I'd like to offer this evening. Um, so again, um, the council generally likes to offer its condolences to, to those that have um, lost loved ones here within the community or, or the family of, of those members. Um, the first one this evening being Winifred, or um, also known as Winnie Alquist, passed away. Um, as you may recall, our former chair at one point, Mr. Ron Alquist, that was his stepmother. Um, we also um, would like to extend the condolences to William Geiger. Um, he was actually the director of um, public works 
here in Scarborough uh, for, for a number of years. Um, he also served both in the United States Marine Corps and in the, in the U.S. Army and actually um, was um, part of engineering with, with my father. Um, so he will be missed as well. Um, also, our condolences to the family of John Duty. Um, again, he, he was um, uh, a on and off lifelong resident in Scarborough. He, he graduated from Scarborough schools. He went to he served our country in Vietnam. Um, he was kind of a local um, for um, his local fisherman, commercial fisherman. So, um, as well as um, offering our condolences to Paulette Herb. Um, she was um, she had. 17 years before she retired with the um, Scarborough School Department on the custodial staff. Mm -hmm. um, so again, our, our condolences to them. And the last one, as I mentioned earlier, um, Becky Delaware, who was not able to come and present tonight, um, lost her, her mother, um, Helen Plummer. So um, again, our condolences to those families. And that's it for comments from me. So it's that time of the evening. Is there a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. All those in favor? Unanimous. Hey.